So today we're going to try and focus on our eschatology overview, um, looking at the rapture, wrath, and reign of Christ and all of us who belong to Christ. And so just a few things. Uh, this is really for our Adventure Club parents and teachers, just to ha kind of have an overview understanding and uh, convey multiple viewpoints that are out there. Um, you know, there's no consensus, and so we have to understand there's different ideas. Uh, I wanted to do more of an academic style, and just to know that this is not a conclusive and all-encompassing lesson. There's so much more to prophecy than we're going to have time to deal with, but just the big highlights and main things. And um, you know, we'll look at several important concepts, and we'll go from there. Uh, these lessons deal with the last five lessons of the Adventure Club series. Um, so lesson 26, Jesus will rescue Christians from wrath. And you look at the first Thessalonians passage, God will pour out his wrath. I'm looking at Revelation, the big part of Revelation there. And we're not going to go to all the details of that. We'll just look at the overview of that. Uh, that he'll reign for a thousand years. And we'll discuss the idea of, uh, is that literal? Is that figurative? Uh, what does it mean specifically? That the sinners will be judged. And so thinking about the great white throne and all those different events that occur at the very end of our time as we understand it. And then the aspect of heaven and hell. And so, you know, what will it be like forever? Uh, nothing, again, is fully conclusive and fully understood just kind of our, our best understanding over the last 2,000 years of, of church history. So the big question, when will Christ return? And uh, we've been asking this as a church body for 2,000 years. Uh, I don't think anybody has a 100% accurate view of this, uh, simply because of some things we'll discuss a little later. Will Jesus have a literal 1,000-year reign? And so is it literal? Is it figurative? Uh, there's different viewpoints on all this kind of stuff. So we'll explore all of that. A few really important things to remember as we go through this. There's about 10 things I want to kind of follow through with and to consider as you study eschatology or, or prophecy, uh, just to keep them, some things in mind. First one is the Bible is one book. It has a key message and it's about God's kingdom. Uh, that's what it's about. And the blessing is that you and I as Christians, um, we are his imagers. As people, we're his imagers. And as Christians, we're his children. And he, we will actually share with him soon his reign. And so just the promises that we, we have as Christians. Now the second thing, we must always interpret the Bible using the Bible. Uh, that's really important. Understanding that chapter breaks and uh, headings and and verse numbers, they're not inspired. Those are just simply developed over time to help us organize better. But make sure you don't use those to, to kind of mess up or, or not think clearly about things. Number three, to understand Revelation, you have to understand the Old Testament. Um, pretty much everything that's been mentioned in Revelation has already been mentioned in the Old Testament. And so, that's just a key understanding. You know, if you have a question about the dragon or uh, or whatever, where did we find that also? Number four, be careful when relying on current scientific understanding and current events. Uh, we don't want to use those to interpret the future simply because things change so quickly. Uh, a good example is, um, you know, thinking back to uh, the book The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. I remember I kind of cut my teeth on that book with uh, understanding prophecy and learning about prophecy. And just to think that you know a lot of the stuff that he wrote there just simply has not come to pass. And so uh, we have to be careful when we do that kind of correlation. Uh, some things in our news might be leading up to certain events that will happen in the future, but probably not aren't exactly tied to those single events. So we have to be careful with that. But prophecy can be cryptic. What do we mean by that? Um, it can't really fully be understood in knowing the exact meaning of what's being implied. So there are some things we can take directly and some things that are kind of indirect. Um, and think of this concept of, you know, there's a lot of ambiguity 
in it. And I say there's lots of specific ambiguity. So, for example, take the kingdom of God. Um, obviously, that was we understand that to be part of the church, the spiritual kingdom of God, that we are the kingdom of God here on earth. However, Christ is not reigning on earth yet. Some people say he reigns through us. In most understandings, though, the king is not here. We don't see him. He's not sitting on the throne here on the earth. And so this is a future element as well. So it's ambiguous. And we have to understand what's the context of that term um, with, the, with the biblical writers, how they're using it for that instance. And it could have a double meaning uh, right within that same context. And just think of the concept of in the military, you know, a general doesn't reveal his whole plan, um, even to his soldiers. Uh, they are to follow the instructions, but he has a master plan. Uh, remember, everything that we see, the enemy can see in Scripture. And so we simply just need to be ready. Uh, we need to look for certain things, but a lot of it still is pretty cryptic. And we need to remind ourselves of that before we kind of you know, hang our hat on one specific theory or another. Number six, you know, prophecy is describing multiple dimensions. Uh, we see this throughout scripture. You have the, you know, the heavenly realm, you have the earth, you have the things under the earth. Uh, you know, in the Old Testament, understanding of Sheol and the abyss and all these kind of strange and weird things that, you know, in our scientific understanding of not modern day, uh, we just haven't fit in our cognitive understanding. But there are some things that we can see in scripture and we can tie to our understanding of you know dimensionality and those kinds of things and I'll, I'll give you some examples a little bit later on that now tied to that is that there is no consensus because there are multiple theories that are out there um, you know the amillennial postmillennial historic premill dispensational premillennial you know these are the most popular ones pretty much amill postmill and premill there's a lot of other ones out there uh, from different denominations or even Christian cults and um, but just we're gonna look at these not too in-depth, but just kind of a cursory overview of them. Uh, so, for example, historic pre-mill, that's simply just referred to as premillennialism, And then dispensational pre-mill, that's just simply referred to as dispensationalism. And we'll explore those in just a little while. Uh, one key understanding also to think through is that we should sharpen each other as Christians. Um, we understand there are multiple viewpoints and that we can kind of refine each other. I ask questions about different viewpoints and um, recognize there are assumptions and presuppositions in each idea, in each theory. And so just to be kind of open minded in that kind of way, um, you know, it, you really shouldn't hang your head on one specific theory because nobody has it 100 percent right. And so to just to simply sharpen your, yourself, I had my own viewpoint for a long, long time. And as I studied other viewpoints and listened to the arguments and uh, and the evidences, I came to refine my thinking and, and it changed somewhat. Uh, not tremendously a lot, but it did change. So think of it this way. You may have seen or heard about the blind mice describing the elephant. Well, think about you know blind scientists. Um, you know, when I train uh, science teachers, I, I have them focus on how do we observe? How do we collect data? Well, think of it this way. Each of these scientists, they're actually accurate based on their focus and the context that they're looking at and or not looking, but they're they're collecting data through through the sense of touch. And so they can take those concepts and give you details. However, without seeing it, the whole thing, without taking your blinds off and just seeing the entire structure of it all, you don't really realize what you're seeing. So again, each perspective perspective is accurate in this model. However, it's not fully accurate. And so I think that's how we should probably treat prophecy as well. Uh, in regard to that, let me give you an understanding of kind of dimensionality and multiple perspectives. If I ask you, what shape is this? Uh, you look and you count, well, there's six sides. It's gotta be hexagon and you're right. However, I go back and say, no, it, it's a cube. So you're wrong. Well, technically you are right because of the shape you see. However, I say it's a cube because let me shed some light on this. As we put light on it, we see it has different dimensions to it. You have length, width, and height, whereas the other picture only had you know pretty much length and width. 
And so we added that detail there. And I think the same thing occurs when understanding scripture um, or the Holy Spirit uh, who's inspired the biblical writers. Um, they were given different viewpoints and different perspectives. And sometimes these verses mean multiple things. Uh, take this example, too, how some descriptions and prophecies seem the same, but they're different. And so if I give you a picture here, this is what you'd see in a fisheye lens. However, if I take the exact same location and use a different camera, I've got the same picture, but it looks different. And so here's a panoramic image of the same fisheye lens. So it's just simply, simply changing the dimension of it. And again, at our level, we can't comprehend some of those things that are in the heavenly dimension. Those are the higher dimension where God and his heavenly beings exist. And so we're trying to interpret some of these things in scripture and we're just like, we fall short with fully comprehending them. Because sometimes they might mean multiple things and they're accurate. Uh, point eight, just to understand, like I've said before, passages can actually be read in more than one way. Uh, there's a concept out there called already but not yet. There's multiple times that we see in the Old Testament and New Testament of, um, of a writer saying something. For example, Joel, he describes the day of the Lord and all these um, you know, end time scenarios. However, in his day, he was actually describing things that occurred at that time as well. But it kind of like it jumps back and forth in perspective. And you have to be really observant when you're doing that kind of study in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So already, but not yet, will also help us to understand why there's so many different theories that each of them might have a correct element here and there, just like with the elephant, but they don't really encapsulate the entirety of it at all. So we will kind of dig into each of the these main perspectives. This is from uh, a really neat graphic organizer developed by Visual Theology. Um, you know, there's a lot of smart people who've held these viewpoints. And, um, you know, like I said, these are different viewpoints. These are different theories. And so these have changed throughout time as well with the church. Um, you know, we're not going to go into in-depth analysis of every one of them, but we do want to focus on the scripture and kind of exposit the text directly, not so much, you know, focus on proving a theory at all. So as you dig in here, um, we're going to look actually at post-millennialism. That one's not as popular anymore. It's not as um, prominent of a viewpoint as much. Um, it just simply means post. Post is after. So, you know, Jesus comes after the millennium and they don't, this viewpoint does not see uh, the millennium as a literal thousand years. It's just kind of a a generic reign of the earth and and they view this as satan losing kind of authority throughout time because uh, the church is increasing and, and, and the church is getting the the world ready for the return of christ this really doesn't in my opinion doesn't really hold a lot of uh, biblical good viewpoint um, but with that viewpoint you have a group called preterist uh, there's preterism and um, this idea that you know, with preterism, all prophecy in the Bible is just history. Uh, they interpret the scripture in the regard of the book of Revelation as kind of symbolic pictures of a first century conflicts and uh, not really a description of what will occur in the end times. Um, you know, preterism itself is a term that means past. And so they view all biblical prophecies as pretty much being fulfilled in the past already. Um, now you have kind of a viewpoint that's opposite, it's called futurist. And the futurists we'll see a little bit later with the premillennialist. They think that a lot of the prophecy has yet to be fulfilled. And so we'll kind of examine that point of view as well. Um, and then even within, if I jump down to the amillennialist, um, that ah is simply there's not a millennium per se necessarily. Um, there's no literal 1,000 year reign of Christ. Uh, again, they see this as kind of a spiritual nature, that it's just the, the kind of the church age and that Jesus will come at the end of that age. Uh, again, you have the preterist and a group called the partial preterist, who they kind of have a mixture of both the historical viewpoint and uh, still things yet to happen. So there's a lot of 
things to kind of pursue and explain with each one. Um, you know, with the partial preterists, they believe that the prophecies in Daniel, Matthew 24, and Revelation, um, maybe except the last two or three chapters, they've already been fulfilled. And they were fulfilled uh, about you know 70 AD uh, when you have Jerusalem destroyed. And so they hold the viewpoint that Revelation had to have been written before that, so before 70 AD. Whereas the Futurist says, no, uh, Revelation was probably written after 95 AD, uh, based upon their their list of evidences as well. So um, again, just multiple viewpoints. Uh, there's a lot of details to go into, but that's not for this study in particular. Uh, but talk to a preterist, talk to a partial preterist, and you know, sharpen, if you're a Futurist, sharpen yourself with what they perceive and maybe, like I said, we're all just blind scientists looking at an elephant trying to describe kind of the pieces that we're, uh, that we're able to, to sense. To the premillennialism, pre is before, so Christ will come before the millennial kingdom. And they view this as a literal thousand years. And so uh, within that group, you have this idea of the tribulation is the future, like the great tribulation. Um, there's... We understand as Christians, there's always been tribulation for followers of Christ. Jesus promised that, you know, if you follow me, you will have tribulation. And so they're perceiving this as more of like a kind of a Daniel fulfillment. And this is the last seven uh, year week of, of kind of before the return of Christ. And so you have a dispensational view and the classical view. Uh, I'm not gonna go into details of those necessarily, uh, dispensations simply mean there are different periods and kind of epics of history that um, that have occurred and have, have purpose. Uh, but with this view, you have the pre-tribulationalist, mid-trib, and the post-tribulationalist. And um, you know the post-tribs think that they that we will all go through the church will go through all the end time scenario as detailed in Revelation six through nineteen. And uh, and so the pre-trib think that we will not go through the tribulation, that we will be taken away and not have to experience the wrath uh, of God. Uh, they won't see the Antichrist and those kinds of things. And the mid-trib, there's actually another kind of theory that's not so much mid-trib, it's more of uh, called pre-wrath. And it's kind of like the three-quarter um, point. I mean, there's not really a specific time period nailed down as for when it would occur. But each of these do believe in a rapture. Uh, pre-trib, post-trib, and the pre-wrath has become more popular nowadays. Um, I'm referencing here Dr. Alan Kirshner. Um, he's been, uh, you know, a big voice as far as kind of promoting pre-wrath and helping to explain it a little bit more. If you see here, they understand that uh, as a church we will see the um, the first several seals opened. Uh, these are the beginning of the birth pains. Uh, this is part of the tribulation time period. Antichrist will be revealed. Uh, he will cause a great tribulation on the saints. And then there will be a rapture in order for the Christians to escape the, the Lord's wrath. And so they think that we will experience the Antichrist tribulation, but not the great tribulation, uh, the wrath of the Lord. Uh, just based on you know different verses that we'll explore a little bit later. So again, uh, if you want to learn more about that, because it's kind of a more of a, a newer rendition of, of some older thinking as well. Um, and they should actually put out a video called The Seven Pre-Trib Problems. Again, another thing for a pre-tripper to, to watch and to sharpen their understanding of. Um, this was developed by researcher Chris White. Uh, and it does a pretty good job of really pinpointing some of those things that a pre-tribulationalist would hold and just some questions that just simply aren't answered through that theory. So just something to explore. Again, does anybody have it completely right? Probably not, they probably won't. Uh, some key verses that we've shared with our, our kids to memorize and for the teachers to go through. Uh, one is 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up. Uh, and we pause in that part right there in the Greek, that's harpazo in Latin, it's rupturo. So, um, you know, for our amillennialists and postmillennialist friends, I mean, this is a clear indication of the rapture. And we'll see some other uh, elements of, you know, the gathering and the reaping as reference to a rapture and a resurrection. 
It says, we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Uh, kind of another key verse is in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is God's wrath. So we can experience the wrath of of the world. We can experience the wrath of Satan, of the Antichrist, but we will not experience the wrath of God himself. And so that's kind of a clear thing that your premillennialist will kind of, um, most of them will hang on. And then Revelation 26, blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. For such a second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And so again, is this understood to be a literal thousand years or a figurative? Um, there are verses in Psalms that describe kind of a figurative use of the word thousand years. Uh, just like we would say for a long time, you know, or for a decade or two, or, you know, that's how we kind of generalize. Some people take that perspective. One thing I've kind of always shared with uh, personally, and this is one thing I'll kind of give you from my personal perspective, is just this idea of, you know, I, I hope for a pre-trib, but I plan for a post-trib. So dealing with a premillennialist viewpoint. Um, and so it's just kind of a something, there's nothing in in the scripture that says you will receive an extra crown if you are a pre-tribulationalist uh, for your faith. Um, matter of fact, a lot of things we see in scripture is we have to endure. We have to endure terrible and hard times and so that's what you'll go to crown for actually martyrdom is specific you'll receive a crown for that so just to kind of you know think through that statement there uh, our ninth point is, point is that uh, jesus didn't or doesn't even know the day or the hour so some scholars say well that was just when he was on the earth as a man uh, and when we see you know what's happening in in revelation the scene in heaven uh, him holding the scroll, uh, he at that point probably will know. I mean, we don't know exactly, so just kind of take that in that context there. But in that Matthew 24 verse, the, the preceding verses actually describe celestial events, and keep keep a put a pin in that because that's a big thing that we're going to focus on here. Um, just the celestial events that happen that is coming on the clouds. Another thing to kind of like, what does that mean on the clouds? And then the gathering of the elect. So it's very specific in that passage in Matthew before the statement. And so just kind of keep that in your mind as we explore further. Number 10, too, that the day or the hour, we don't know. However, think of that phrase, day or the hour. That's a very specific, narrow point of time. What does the scripture tell us? What, do, what does Paul say? What does, what, do the, uh, what does Jesus say? He said, we should be aware of the season. We should be watching and be aware. And a season, if you're looking at time, is in three to four months. And so not to say that we will know exactly the day or the hour, but we should know a very specific time frame of, of when his return will occur. And there appears to be some, some of those prophecies that are very specific about that. And also, if we take the idea of, of his second coming time frame, like his first coming. So his first coming, do we count when he was born? Uh, do we count when he started his ministry? Do we count when he died and rose again? Or is it all of it? You know, 33 years of his first coming. Might there be an extended time that we're not really fully understanding for his second coming? And some people have a difficult time with that. They think it's all in one shebang. Maybe it's not. And if you really examine the scriptures, it seems like there's actually points of reference of different transition times and, and things like this between the different seals and, and all these different things that, that will occur. So just kind of keep that concept uh, in your mind as well. So what are some things that are certainties that, that, that we all kind of share together, the non-negotiables? Because uh, a lot of other stuff is we can take theories based on these specific viewpoints. Again, just like the, the elephant thing. But what are some things we can see as a whole elephant? Um, first, that there will be the day of the Lord. That is guaranteed. That is a very important key phrase when looking and understanding about prophecy. That Jesus will return and reign. Our king will come back. Um, it's just not a spiritual thing. It will, it will become real and physical one day again. Uh, God will bring judgment on sin and the enemies of God. 
he is going to pour out his wrath and it's going to be the worst thing in all of history. Uh, and this, in my opinion, does kind of culminate that old question of, you know, why does a good God allow evil to exist? Well, he only allows it to exist for a short time, for a time frame. He will bring justice in the end and people will reap what they sow. Uh, we are promised resurrection. And so it says we will be like him. And, you know, we hang our hat, our whole faith on the resurrection of Christ. And he promised us the same thing. We will be raised once again, uh, bodily, bodily raised. And that we as Christians should long for his return. Uh, we should be watching and waiting and we should be ready. And we should be doing what we're supposed to be doing. Proclaiming the gospel, furthering his kingdom until he returns. So we'll look at several parallels and patterns, just like a detective, just like you know, the scientists that we, we train. We want to see patterns. We want to see what, the, what does the data say? And so we have the scene in heaven. We have you know, the lamb with the scroll. We have Christ holding the scroll. He's the one who's opening the scroll. And remember, you cannot see what's inside the scroll until all the seals have been broken. Um, and so that kind of keeps understanding that it's all happening within a specific time frame, maybe not over the ages, but as a specific kind of moment um, in time. And so you have these seven seals and each seal holds an important feature to it. And we'll look at a few of them here soon. Um, and then one viewpoint I want to share is that, um, you know, I have this little star here between the sixth and seventh seal. There's something that happens that's just phenomenal, that, that's unmistakable as far as a sign. And we'll, we'll look at that understanding of the celestial events that will occur that no one can deny. Uh, in the seventh seal, some interpreters say that, you know, within that you have the seven trumpets. And so just as you have the birth pangs, uh, just as contractions on a pregnant mom happen, they, you know, slower and slower and then faster, faster, faster. And then to finally, you kind of increase. And that's what we see with the seven trumpets. And then you have the seven vials or the seven bowls. And again, this is the, this is within the seventh trumpet and the seven trumpets are within the seventh seal. And see, just think of all those sevens. Why are all those sevens there? Keep that in mind with the number seven, how that's used over and over again. Some other parallels just to kind of consider and look and think through. Um, 144,000. We see that in chapter seven of Revelation and chapter 14. Is it repeating the same thing or is it just simply expanding on the same concept? So that, there's a parallel there. You have this idea of the great multitude, again, also in chapter seven and chapter 14. Is it repetition or is it uh, multiple perspective? And then finally, the destruction on the earth, seeing rivers and men and all kinds of crazy things. We see that in chapter eight and chapter 16. It's is it repetition or is it the same thing just being described in a different way there. Another pattern we see is the lightning, thunder, earthquake, and hell. And this is what the folks who have the perspective of, you know, the seventh seal has the seven trumpets and the seventh trumpet has the seven vials as just kind of a, you know, contractions getting closer and closer. And so we do see that same pattern happening and that's how they get the understanding of, oh, it's the same thing that's occurring. Cause these are big things. Do they happen three different times or is it the same thing happening? Just described in a different perspective. And then this kind of great hope that we have as Christians, the gathering and the reaping, uh, the rapture, the resurrection. And we see that uh, Matthew 24, Luke, and Mark, you, this escape understanding. Um, and then Paul describes in Thessalonians and in to the Corinthians. And so uh, we finally see you know, the detail of it in Revelation 7 and, and 14 as well. So each of them, are they explaining the same thing? Are they different events? Uh, you know, that's what we have to kind of question as we begin to analyze and dig deep into this. So kind of tied to that is this understanding of the great multitude. Um, and it's important when you read Revelation, what what's being worn? And so just as, you know, we can identify different cultures here on earth by kind of their the style of clothes traditionally. Uh, same thing with military uniforms. What you wear is kind of a, an interesting point of clarity for the reader as they go through the book of Revelation. And so in Revelation 6 and 7, you've got the fifth seal and the sixth seal. 
um, there's there's we'll look into details here here pretty soon but there's a robe what kind of robe is it? it's a white robe uh, at one point they're not wearing it another point they are wearing it is it the same group um, same thing in Revelation 19 at the marriage supper you know what are they wearing in these white robes these fine linen uh, and then Revelation 22 um, just simply describing you know the blessed they are, they are washed robes washed by the blood of the lamb so keep that understanding too as you read the revelation and you see um, basically the identifying factor of what is being worn and so just to kind of digging further as far as comparison and seeing patterns we'll take the gospel accounts and jesus describes the, the last days with uh, paul's description mostly the thessalonians and, and in corinthians as well and then Revelation 6 through 8 and see is there a correlation there uh, again not to say it's definitive but you just see these patterns and you know, as a scientist I, I see patterns I see points and does it really fit together perfectly um, how can we understand the different perspectives there so uh, this is kind of a chart I put together just own, from my own notes um, you know trying to align things up as much as I can um, I'm always weary to, to look at people's, you know, their end times charts and things like that. But this is just my own personal reflection. You can take it or leave it. We'll, we'll go into details with it here soon. The first thing we'll look at are the different seals. So again, on the left, the gospel accounts, Paul's accounts in the middle, and uh, John or Jesus's revelation. So the first thing we see is there are false Christ mentioned by Christ. Uh, they will come. And in Revelation, we see the first seal, which a lot of people interpret as the arrival of the Antichrist. Um, and we have wars, rumors of wars. On um, the second seal, you have Red Horse, which is dealing with wars. Now, just to clarify, I don't think this is, especially in Revelation, it's describing just generally wars over time. This, I think, specifically identifies with the wars of the Antichrist. And so we see in Revelation, he makes war on different groups and things like that so keep that in mind of the specificity related to that not so much these great world wars but simply tied to the antichrist himself um, the description of famines with the third seal uh, being specific about famines and then we go to you know the gospels and then to paul's understanding of birth pains and labor pains that kind of correlation there i'm sure paul uh, understood or at least listened or heard about the sermons that Jesus gave on the end times. Uh, and then the fourth seal, uh, correlation with that, being killed and hated, uh, death with a sword. So we have this martyrdom that will occur. And so how do we deal with that? Well, are there Christians right now in the world being martyred? There are. And sometimes in our American bubble, uh, we feel protected and, oh, it's not, that's not us. But more Christians than not are suffering persecution. Uh, but this deals specifically with that time with the Antichrist's arrival. Uh, then you have the apostasy, the falling away. Um, some interpreters, uh, specifically pre-treaters, kind of identify this as a way of escape. Uh, that's not really the term. This is a falling away, not kind of a, a, a pulling away. Um, we see it tied with a strong delusion and there with uh, Paul's understanding. And in Revelation, we kind of skip back to chapter 3, where, you know, lukewarm or spit out of his mouth. He'd rather you be, you know, hot or cold, like hot, like good hot tea or hot coffee or, or good cold water. Something that is pleasing, not the lukewarm stuff that we want to spit out. Then we get to the idea of the abomination, this understanding of desolation, abomination that causes desolation. Um, from the gospel accounts and then paul describes a man of lawlessness that takes his seat and in revelation there's all kinds of scripture from basically um you know 6 through 19 about the antichrist and, and the things that are happening so just to have a point of clarity second thessalonians chapter 2 3 through 4 um you have this concept here that paul says let no one deceive you in any way I'm talking to the thessalonians for that day will not come. Let me stop there. What day is he talking about? You go back a few verses. And he says that with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. So that resurrection, that rapture. So for that day will not come. 
his return, the resurrection, the rapture, unless what? The rebellion or the apostasy comes first, the great falling away from the faith by many. And then the man of lawlessness is revealed, understood to be the Antichrist. And you skip forward a little bit so that he takes his seat in the temple of God. This is that great abomination described. And this will cause a desolation to leave, to flee from that place because of the wrath that's about to come. And so when he takes his seat in the temple of God, he proclaims himself to be God. That is the great abomination because he is not God. So we also have this understanding, and especially in, in pre-tribulational thinking, of this idea of imminency, that Christ can come at any moment. But the preceding slide with um, what Paul described in the Thessalonians kind of is kind of a retort to that. Um, it says, well, we know this things will happen. The falling away, uh, the, the Antichrist will be revealed uh, before Christ comes, before the resurrection rapture occurs. Um, if we look at the seals and we see some other things we'll look at here in a second, there are some clear things that must occur. However, I think with a lot of the biblical writers, they do have this understanding of expectancy. We are to expect our king to return. Uh, not so much that he can return any moment. There has to be certain things that happen. Just like in his first coming, uh, there had to be certain things that set up for his first coming. Same with the second coming. So to get towards the bottom there, uh, understanding of this and you know, the aspect of death, you know, there is death that's going to be occurred kind of tied to the fourth seal. So in that fifth seal, you see martyrs. And uh, we'll kind of go into detail about the fifth seal here in a second. But notice kind of some of the details in that passage as we, as we explore it here in just a second. So fourth seal and fifth seal kind of tied together with that based upon the work of the Antichrist. So just to pause and just remind us, the sixth seal really is a key point. It's unmistakable. It, this is something that's directly observable. Uh, you know, you can't really fudge the interpretation. It's a pl pretty clear kind of a celestial thing that's going to occur. And so to me, this is a this is a big thing. We examine again the, the three sections of scripture. Uh, we have this understanding of the day of the Lord. Um, this signals the impending day of the Lord, the sixth seal does. And what, what happens? You've got the sun, moon, stars all shaken. Um, you get the sun turning black and, and the moon blood red. You have the stars falling. You have this earthquake. These are the same things that are prophesied all throughout the Old Testament as well, specifically Joel 2. So you see these patterns of all these things happening together. Um, one interesting note about earthquake is that it just it seems like every time someone is raised in scripture, there is a, there's a, an earthquake tied to that. Uh, I think uh, Earthquake Resurrection uh, is a book that I read previously that kind of clarified some of that for me. Um, and so imagine when all the dead in Christ are raised. That will be a global earthquake. Maybe this earthquake is tied to these celestial things causing the sun to go dark, causing the moon not to, uh, to be blood red, causing the stars or we would understand these as anything in the heavens to fall. Uh, asteroids or comets, uh, you know, all kinds of debris that's in space. Let's look at Matthew 24 and Revelation 6 as I've identified in that, you know, in that chart there. So, or Matthew 24. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven. Let's jump to Revelation, where it says, when he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth. A direct correlation there. And that's repeated multiple times in Revelation and the Old Testament as well. Back to 24, Matthew 24. And the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So something major is happening in space uh, that nobody can deny. It says, then will appear in the heaven the sign of the Son of Man. Don't know what that is specifically, but it's definitely something that's clear that says this is the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Again, what are these clouds he's coming on? With power and great glory. Then he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet. So keep that in mind, what's happening? There's a trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds, and from one end of the heaven to the other. So jump to Revelation now. So all these things happen celestial as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that's being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. 
and we go further in Revelation. What are the people doing? Uh, the the kings of the earth, the the um, the, the rich, the princes, they're all hiding in the ground. They're covering themselves up and hiding in caves and they're asking the, the you know, the, the mountains to cover them, to protect them from this, you know, catastrophic thing that's coming upon the earth. And so jump back to another time when something like this happened. Uh, the darkness during the crucifixion. Was that an eclipse? Uh, well, the thing is, eclipses last just minutes not hours. This one was three hours long, uh, about. It had to be something else. Um, and so just even understanding this idea of, of Passover, um, it's always celebrated during a full moon in spring, but a new moon is what's needed for a solar eclipse to occur. So this was not an, a normal cyclical event. Uh, this had to have been something that was either supernatural or something natural but it just to give not give too many details but just something else that's heavenly some other heavenly body that blocked the sun for that amount of time it had to have been close to the earth it had to have been large um, you know it wasn't just a regular weather event um, as it's described by the gospels this was something else um, so it's just something interesting interesting to look at as we jump here at the next point, this is where you know, a lot of our pre-tribulationalists and uh, pre-wrath and, and these people really focus on, you know, the rapture. And we are promised a resurrection. The rapture is a resurrection. Look in the Gospels. You know, Jesus is seen on the clouds of heaven. Uh, there's a trumpet. Angels gather the elect. Um, we see this escape provided. Um, as you jump to Revelation 14, and, and the, sun, the day of the Son of Man is revealed in, in Luke. And so then we go to Paul. Paul says something similar. He says, Jesus descends from heaven. There's a trumpet. There's a cry of command. Uh, we're caught up in the clouds. You know, again, what are these clouds again? Uh, believers are not appointed to wrath. It's promised. And then in Corinthians, he says, the la at the last trump, the dead are raised and we will be changed. And then we jump to Revelation. We have here the multitude. So who is this multitude occurring right after that? Uh, so let's look at that here as we, we dig further. Now, just as a tangent, some things to think about. It's kind of interesting. These clouds of heaven. Uh, these aren't like the rain clouds we're thinking of like in Luke 12, 54. This is something else. Daniel describes with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man is coming. Um, a day of wrath, a day of clouds by Joel and Zephaniah. Acts. They saw Jesus received by a cloud. Okay? And then coming on the cloud, we will meet him in clouds, coming with the clouds. Just when you have a chance, kind of explore that. I don't know what to make of it necessarily, uh, but just something to think about. So to understand this pattern with the multitude and, and really what they wear, keep in mind what people are wearing. In the fifth seal, the martyrs in, in chapter Revelation 6, 9, it says they're under the altar. Now, we don't know exactly what that is. Uh, it, further in Revelation, we see that um, in the seventh uh, bowl judgment, in the seventh trumpet, in the seventh seal, that an angel takes fire from the altar and throws it on the earth. This is describing something under the altar. So something under heaven. What's that? It's the earth itself. Um, it could be reference to Sheol, the abode of the dead, where the dead live, live where the dead are, um, whether they're cognizant or not, whether they're asleep. I mean, that's another tangent subject. But, um, but what we see here in this episode is that that there's no body because the, you know it's just a soul. They're given white robes, but they're not wearing them yet. And so to keep that in mind, whereas you jump to the sixth seal in chapter seven, we see the great multitude. Um, this is the ones from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And you know, the angel even says to John, these are the ones coming out of the Great Tribulation. And, and that Greek word there uh, can also say escape from. So they did not suffer through the Great Tribulation, the God's wrath on the earth. They're now in heaven. There's a scene that's in heaven. So this group is now wearing white robes washed in the blood. And now you see that they're actually holding something in their hand that's palm branches, so they have a body. It's compared to the fifth seal saints that don't have a body necessarily, or at least not defined well. 
So Revelation 7, 9 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one can count, from every tribe, uh, from every nation, and all tribes and people and tongues. That sure does sound like the church, doesn't it? Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. You realize that if you're in Christ, this is a picture of your future. Um, this is going to happen according to premillennialist in the future. I don't see how this could have happened necessarily right now. Um, so just something to think, think, think about. You are in the Bible, and this is what you'll be doing. Uh, also, as you jump to Revelation 19, again, the same concept of this great multitude. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. It was given to her to clothe herself in what? In fine linen, bright and clean. Again, these white robes. So another pattern we want to see, it's very interesting. Uh, we take that concept of the 144,000, as I mentioned earlier in chapter 7, and then you jump to chapter 14, you see the same 144,000. Well, the following verses after that in chapter 7, like 9 through 17, you have the scene of the great multitude in heaven. No one could count. All the tribes, tongues, and nations it has to be the church. They're clothed in white robes. And then we see this interesting pattern after this occurrence in chapter 14. It says, Another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Again, who's on the cloud? Jesus. Uh, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. So you have this harvest occurring of good things. You're not harvesting you know, the bad stuff. You're harvesting good things. Then he who sat on the cloud swung the sickle of the earth, and the earth was reaped. We also see in Revelation, I'm sorry, at that point in Matthew, as we jump to Matthew here, 24, 30, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather the, together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. So you see this commander, uh, this angel, uh, you see, um, well, let's dig into this next part here. In Thessalonians, another scripture, the Lord himself would ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. Again, the voice of an archangel. Other passages says the angels will reap. So remember, an angel, based on a previous study, is a messenger. Uh, Jesus himself was the angel of the Lord, simply the messenger of the Lord. And so, you know, there's this trumpet call. You see that correlation there, the crying out, a shout. Uh, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds, again, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. So Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians 4, Revelation 14, they all kind of say the same thing, don't they? You have the pattern of preceding verses, and then a following verse there, Revelation 7, 9 through 17. You see the scene in heaven. Uh, so just something to think through. I'm saying it's not like, you know, you know, perfectly straightforward, but it seems to be a specific pattern there. And then jump to the Old Testament. Isaiah 26 has this phenomenal passage. It says, your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. Sounds like the resurrection. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. Remember, those who are dead first will rise, and then those of us who are alive will join them after that. Uh, what Paul says, For your dew is a dew of light, and the earth shall give birth to the dead. Again, blatantly very resurrection type of language. Verse 20, Come, my people, enter your chambers, and shut up your doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until the fury has passed. What is this? Remember Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. What's he preparing? We have this concept of this new Jerusalem, this heavenly Jerusalem, the city of God. Is this the chambers he's talking about in Isaiah? I don't know. 21, for behold, the Lord is coming out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. And the earth will disclose the blood and shut on it and will no more cover its slain. So kind of in a pre-millennialist um, perspective, you see this idea of uh, the dead being raised, the resurrection, the rapture, uh, then those who enter their chambers, uh, they're hiding themselves for a little while. Uh, we understand that might be the marriage supper of the Lamb, uh, the scene in heaven. Um, and so after that, then you have the Lord's wrath on the earth. They're not experiencing the Lord's wrath on the earth. 
And then finally, um, kind of after that point of the resurrection rapture, we do see God's wrath displayed. And so, you know, Jesus says, as in the days of Noah, as in the days of Lot, you know, the righteous are the ones who escape his wrath, as we see in a pattern in history. Um, Paul says, kind of in a connection with that, you know, they're saying peace and safety, and then sudden destruction come upon them. They think that um, maybe with the Antichrist that they actually have the world as they want it, and the world is perfected, but the Lord's wrath will come upon the world. And so in Revelation, we see the seventh seal. Now, this is, you know, God's wrath displayed. It's opening within the day of the Lord. Um, again, is the day of the Lord, is it specifically a single 24-hour day? Is it a five-month period? Is it a multi-year period? I mean, there's different interpretations. Uh, you also see the subsequent trumpet and bold judgments that are within the seal. Uh, I don't think you're going to look at years here, uh, maybe weeks and months, uh, but not one 24-hour day in particular. It's a concept of the day of the Lord, which is basically, what we'll look at here later, it's the beginning of the Lord's reign. And if you take that perspective as a day is like a thousand years, that fits perfectly with that concept. So, as I mentioned earlier in Revelation 8, you know, the seventh seal, you have um, the angel took the censer and filled it from the, with a fire from the altar, again, in heaven, we mentioned those who were under the altar, who were slain, maybe on, in the earth, on the earth, under the earth, and he threw it on the earth, and there were peals of thunder, rumbling, flashes of lightning, and earth, earthquake. Again, you see that imagery there that is a very detailed, observable point of view of evidence. So just to think through also some kind of general concepts that you know, in the Gospels would say, you know, Jesus, says, no one knows. Uh, he doesn't know. Um, he gives understanding of like it's like a thief in the night. Um, you have to keep watch. That's what we do to protect what we have. We keep watch so that thieves will not take. Uh, he says for us as followers, it's not a surprise to us. Um, we won't be surprised as a, as a thief uh, by the thief. Uh, Paul says that you know times and dates. And there's no need. He does say you know uh, don't be um, persuaded by heretical views. Uh, you know, that were being taught that day, and maybe even still are taught today. Uh, again, the same thing with the thief in the night. The thief in the night um, sounds like he he heard Jesus' sermons or heard from the apostles who shared Jesus' sermons. In Revelation uh, six and on, we see this aspect of this you know thousand years, and um, you know is it literal or figurative? So let's jump to Revelation nineteen, and just as a kind of a quick overview, we see in this passage. The great multitude, they're worshiping the Lord. You have this scene of the marriage supper of the Lamb. If you've ever done a study of Jewish, ancient Jewish weddings, there's a very interesting correlation that we see in ancient Jewish weddings and the marriage supper of the Lamb, just the whole aspect of the end times. Something, something to look into. Um, this says Jesus returns with the armies of heaven. Again, what are these armies wearing? They're clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Again, I said it's important what people are wearing in heaven. And it helps you identify who they're talking about. This is the church. These are believers who have been raptured. Uh, they're on white horses to bring judgment on the earth. So there are animals in heaven, aren't there? Uh, but we come back to help rule and reign. And we also will, you know, Paul says, we will judge the angels that sinned. Um, and then you see the Antichrist and the false prophet thrown into the lake of fire. So they are going to be no more. As you look in Revelation 20, uh, 1 through 6, we see that Satan is thrown to the abyss to be bound for a thousand years. There's a thousand year time frame again. Is it literal or figurative? Uh, but he is chained in the abyss. And again, where's the abyss? The abyss is understood in the Old Testament is to be in the center of the earth. Um, basically, an abyss is a bottomless hole. The only place you can have a bottomless hole is within inside a sphere. So that's um, you know where it's in the earth, just like the... Um, those watchers that sinned in the days of um, Noah or before that, preceding that, um, you know, their judgment, they were they were chained in the abyss, just as Peter describes. Um, then you have the tribulation martyrs come to life and reign for a thousand years. Again, this thousand year time frame. Now we compare that with the resurrection of life before the millennium at the rapture versus the resurrection of the judgment at the end of the millennium. So there are two resurrections. 
And one is for believers and the other is for those non-believers. And they will face the great white throne judgment that we'll see a little bit later. Now, as far as those who come back to life and they reign for a thousand years, who are they reigning over? Well, we can infer these are the people on the earth who survived the great tribulation. There's not going to be a lot of people, but from that point on, they will kind of repopulate this earth. Um, and again, it's not the new earth yet. It's simply the, um, it's the restful thousand years. So we'll, we'll look at that here in a second. John chapter 5, 25 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. I mean, remember, when Christ returned, how did people raise from the dead? It was a voice, like an archangel. It was a voice of Christ, a cry. It was a great shout, like a trumpet. And they will be risen. So do no marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So you see, like here it says, in, in some perspectives, and already, but not yet. Uh, here you have one instance occurring and then something else occurring a thousand years later, all in the same verse. So it's just a matter of interpretation, a matter of kind of understanding what perspective you're looking at. Now you think about this. Remember when Jesus prayed that kingdom come, that will be done. This is the final culmination, the, the final fulfillment of his kingdom coming. Yes, we are his kingdom here on the earth right now. But his real kingdom, his heavenly kingdom, is coming to the earth to be set up and established once again. So let's jump into kind of a specific tangent on this understanding of a thousand years. Why a thousand years specifically? Uh, is that literal or figurative? You know, an amillennialist says it's, it's figurative, it's not literal. Your premillennialists say it is literal, a thousand years. I asked, you know, why didn't he say a million years or, or a billion years? You know, why a thousand years? In ancient people, sure, they said a thousand years was like a long time frame. Okay, it's a general figurative approach. But what if it's both? Again, that multi-dimensional view that I expressed earlier. Um, so let me give you kind of a thought exercise. Uh, think about astronomy. Think about space science. Uh, where does the time measurement for the year come from? I'll give you a second to think about that. All right, if you said it right, it is. It is the, it's one full revolution of the Earth around the Sun. It's one full orbit of the Earth around the Sun. And that's where a year comes from, 365 days. Possibly, used to be 360 days. And what number 360 do you see elsewhere? In math, maybe. That's right, that's how many degrees are in a circle. Have you ever seen the correlation between the number of days in a year and the number of degrees in a circle? It seems like there sure is a connection there, isn't it? Okay, I mean, why wouldn't they just put, you know, 10 degrees in a circle or, or 100 degrees in a circle? Why the number 360? Well, it's based upon the understanding of that's how many days are in a year. And again, we have 365 now, so maybe something did occur in the past uh, that caused the dates to change. What about this? What about the time measurement for the month? Where does that come from? What's astronomical about the month? Very good. Uh, that deals with the lunar cycle. So the, the complete phases of the moon. Uh, it takes about you know 29 and a half days for the moon to go through all the phases. And if you understand the word month, it's actually a shortened from uh, an older word of month. So you have the word month in the word month. It's lunar cycle. What about the day? What's astronomical about the day? It's pretty simple. It's one 24 hours. It takes it that much time to, to basically rotate on its axis. And so those are all astronomical things. They're things we can quantify. Right? I skipped one measurement. Do you recall what measurement I skipped? What about the week? How is that measured astronomically? Well, we can't measure it astronomically. Um, where do we get this from? It can't be measured that way. However, every culture on the globe has always used a seven day week. Now there's been a few tangents, a few, you know, small groups that would use it 10 days or, you know, emperors that would change it to a five day kind of thing. But pretty much almost every ancient culture had seven days for a week. And it's been around since when? 
been around since Adam. It comes from the creation of all of things, and it's also a measure of all of time. So keep that concept in your mind. Why seven? You know, we see these seven seals, the seven trumpets, seven bowls. We see there's seven days in a week. Why are there seven days in a week? Well, as we dig into this, we'll see this understanding of the divine week. The academic term is called the sexta septimum lineal construct. Big phrase, just simply meaning the divine week. Uh, God created that for a reason. There's six literal days of creating. Uh, so there's no kind of day age theory here where um, it, it just, we won't go on the tangent there, but it, uh, kind of a literalist viewpoint of creation, six days to create. And he rested on the seventh day, on the seventh day. I mean, did he have to? Was he tired? He's, he's God. He's not tired. He's setting it as a, a divine pattern uh, for all of time. So think back what Peter says in 2 Peter 3.18 or 3.8. It says concerning the day of judgment. Okay, He says this one phrase. He says, but do not overlook this one fact. Stop right there. When a writer tells you, don't overlook something, listen to the rest of it. He says, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. I, I would say most Christians nowadays, they overlook this one fact. They do not listen to Peter. But when you take this divine week perspective, listen to what Peter says. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. So all, all millennials' friends need to also pay attention to the first two. They kind of ignore, they overlook this one fact as well. So think back to Genesis 2.17. Remember when God told Adam, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. From that day you shall eat of it, you will die. Well, did he die that 24-hour day? No. He was 930 years old when he died, based upon a literal understanding of those time frame. So that day is like a thousand years. Okay, and again, I'm not gonna say exactly like 1000. Uh, 930 may not be a full day in God's time frame, a thousand years. Again, it's a general concept, right? Now think about the early Christian writers. They actually held that at the end of 6,000 years of history, Christ would return and reign for a thousand years, what we refer to as the millennium. So you think about Barnabas, Papias, Polycarp. Polycarp was a disciple of John, uh, who wrote Revelation. Uh, Irenaeus, uh, there's different ways you can say his name. But um, all these different early Christian writers, uh, disciples of the disciples, um, their perspective is like that. Think about Irenaeus. Um, he was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John. So you have a pretty direct link there to the one who actually saw the visions. So Irenaeus actually said in some of his writings that those who allegorize biblical prophecies are heretics. He would, he would look at an all-millennialist perspective as heretical. I'm saying him, not me, but as him. Uh, now think about those 300 years after Irenaeus, Augustine, will convince many folks that they should only see prophecies as allegory. And so with the start of the kind of the Roman Catholic Church, um, you know, this has became the main viewpoint of the global church and still is the most popular view viewpoint, the all millennialist perspective. And again, they see pretty much almost everything as allegory, where Irenaeus would say that's heretical. Irenaeus actually wrote concerning a belief of the other church. For the day of the Lord is as 6,000 years, and in six days created things were completed. It is evident, therefore, that they will come to an end at the 6,000 years. Again, he's thinking of actual numbers, not allegory. And then Barnabas, look at what he wrote. He says, as there has been 2,000 years from Adam to Abraham, and 2,000 from Abraham to Christ, so there will be 2,000 years for the Christian era, and then would come the millennium. You're getting Barnabas saying this, you guys, you know, early uh, Christian father saying these details here. Uh, so Barnabas didn't expect Jesus to return in his day. So if you look at the divine week, six days of creation, a day of rest, that is symbolic of all of time. There's six days of toil, 6,000 years of toil, and the millennial reign is the Sabbath rest, a thousand year rest. And so from Adam to Abraham, 2,000 years, Abraham to Jesus, 2,000, Jesus first to second coming is 2,000, and then at the end of that is the last year, or the last day, it's the last thousand years. 
And at the end of the last thousand years, the end of the seventh day, the eighth day, you have the new heavens and the new earth. So a big concept, again, um, something interesting. And we see this as a fact that, think about this too, what I mentioned earlier, Jesus' first coming. When do we count his first coming? His birth, his ministry, his death, his resurrection? We count all of that. And so if he, some scholars say he was born 4 BC, and that he was crucified 30 AD, and some say 33 AD, well, it's 2,000 years after his death and resurrection. You're looking at, you know, 2030, 2033, 2029. 20, I mean, we have no clue. We have no clue. But it's an interesting kind of pattern. Uh, but as we saw with, you know, Adam, he lived 930 years. It wasn't exactly a full thousand years. So I don't think we can hang our hat on any specific day or hour. But maybe a season. Uh, maybe we'll understand that. Who knows? Just an interesting concept to think through. Uh, then we jump to this idea of the millennial Jerusalem. Uh, you know, Jesus will reign from his throne for a thousand years. It's a literal perspective. And he'll reign from Jerusalem. Well, Ezekiel has descriptions of this. Um, obviously, we have description in Revelation about it as well. But the details kind of are interesting. And maybe there's two different descriptions of this new Jerusalem. Maybe this Jerusalem that it could be a cube, it could be a pyramid, a mountain. I mean, it's described in multiple ways. Um, and if you take a literal understanding mathematically described in the scriptures, uh, this thing is huge on the earth. And this is what will be on the earth for the thousand year reign. Uh, look, at 11 by 11 miles. Again, it could be pyramidal, it could be a cube, it could be you know a, a mountain shape. There's not a specific full-fledged consensus of what it would look like. However, when we jump to Revelation 20, starting in verse 7, we see that Satan is released after a thousand years. Why is released? We don't know. God's in control. Um, but there's not much more after them after that. There's a quick battle at the end. Uh, it's the last battle ever that'll happen. Satan is then thrown into the lake of fire. Remember, the Antichrist and the, and the false prophet were thrown in there a thousand years before. So Daniel 7 describes a lot of these details as well. Now we see, from 11 on, we see this great white throne judgment. Um, at this point, you guys, it says, the earth and heaven fled away. There's no more earth and heaven. It's just the throne of God. And guess what happens to everyone? Everyone who does not have Christ, who does not know Christ, who has not reigned with Christ. So the unbelievers, this is their second resurrection. This is the second resurrection, the resurrection unto judgment. They are now going to be judged for their works. Now, again, we as Christians, we did face a judgment, the Bema Seat judgment, the judgment seat of Christ. But that was not judging us for our sins. That was a judgment for our good works that we had done. And maybe that occurs during the, during the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, maybe it occurs at a different point. But for this judgment, it's for unbelievers who have to face their face of a God who is a just God. Um, and then it says death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. There's no more death. There's no more Hades. That makes some people say that there's this idea of annihilism, that um, hell is not like forever and ever and ever and ever. It actually will end at this point. Um, I don't know. There's different viewpoints on that. Um, we have these terms forever. Well, forever denotes an aspect of time. At this point, if heaven and earth fled away, is there time any longer? Um, the idea of eternal judgment that we see in, by the biblical writers, does that denote time? Is there something past that? There's a lot of just semantics that can go back and forth in this. So it's just interesting that death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. Like what John MacArthur said, he said, The folly of sinners is that they choose to face the tribunal of God and plead innocence. Think about the great white throne. That's what's going to happen a lot. So rather than plead guilty now and receive a pardon through Jesus Christ, um, those who aren't in Christ, our children, uh, our neighbors, our family, our friends, uh, we want to help them understand they've got to confess now. Uh, they need the pardon of Christ now. 
because when they do face that second, second resurrection, the resurrection unto judgment, they are going to face judgment for their sins. And it's a righteous judgment. They chose to reject the author and the creator of life, uh, the savior of all. And so just kind of keep that in mind. It's a great call for us to, to truly um, further the gospel, to make disciples of all nations. And then we look at Revelation 21. We do have this concept of a new heaven and a new earth. The first had passed away. And you know, 2 Peter 3 says, The heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. Everything, so all of creation, original creation, will, like I said, the heaven and earth will flee. Uh, it'll melt, it'll burn, it'll dissolve. So here we have, at that, after this, we will see the spiritual and physical realm reunited that veil is finally lifted okay at this point whenever adam and eve sinned they caused a rift between the spiritual between the heavenly and between the earthly and so at this point when we now have a new heaven and new earth there is no more rift there's no more split it's all together and so again we see this concept of the new jerusalem coming down out of heaven this time and so here's just some fun graphics I, we don't know. I mean, nobody knows what it's going to look like, or we have some descriptors. But again, there are different dimensions listed between Ezekiel and different authors, and, and between in Revelation. Um, if you take some of the more literal, literal perspectives, if we take the the uh, the diameter of the moon, it's about 2,100 miles. What's well, described as New Jerusalem is about 1,380 miles or 1,500 miles, depending on your use of the numbers uh, from Ezekiel and different things, it seems ginormous. And in our concept, we think of this as kind of crazy. But remember, this is the new heaven, the new earth. This is not the same old, same old. Uh, we don't know what kind of physics will be involved here. We don't know what, um, just anything. It's all gonna be new. Again, is a cube, a pyramid, or a mountain? That they're all described in kind of a similar even different ways. There's different dimensions we're understanding here, and we can't perceive it all fully. Since for the former things have passed away, behold, I am making all things new. Finally, everything is restored. Everything is new. I mean, brands making new, right? Only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life will actually enter this. And so this is only for believers. Uh, just another wake-up call to, to share Christ and um, to, to further his kingdom here on earth right now. So John 14 says, In my Father's house are many rooms. Hmm. It's going to be a wonderful place, right? If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may also be. So that is our ultimate destination, you guys, to be in the presence of God. Revelation 3, he reminds us, Jesus said, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Again, this idea of this new Jerusalem, and he will not go out from it anymore, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God and the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Another just amazing, wonderful promise uh, that we will be with our Lord. So now we'll dive into Revelation chapter 22. And this is kind of the last of the last things that we see. As we explore it, um, there's a few important details to look and to observe. And we'll explore those. So verse one, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. As we look at this, this is a clear reference to the Garden of Eden. Uh, Genesis two, that river comes out of Eden to water the garden. Remember Eden was this glorious, mountain and um, it was you know the garden of God it was where uh, this heavenly council met and all these amazing things we see throughout all of scripture describing Eden this is a return to that uh, and then think about this how does the gospel describe Jesus he's the living water um, he told this to the woman at the well and so it's a wonderful thing to see again this water of life that it provides. It's bright, it's clear, it's crystal, it's pure. It flows from the throne. So, you know, this is formerly a judgment seat, but now it's a source of blessing. Remember, there's no more need for judgment after this point. 
It says of God and of the Lamb. So now you have them together again. They're not separated. Uh, they are fully together in the new heavens and new earth. Through the middle of the street of the city. So you've got this amazing city and other places we see the streets of gold. I mean, even our nicest, finest treasure, just pavement in this new Jerusalem. And I, I'm pretty sure it's more than what we can even imagine, honestly. Um, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the trees, of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Um, so here we have kind of a double reference here, it seems like. Um, it's just kind of a, a difficult passage to really ascertain. But the fact that there's 12 kinds of fruit, I mean, you think about the number 12, 12 tribes, the 12 apostles, 12 months, honestly, and, um, you know, each month. So we distinguish a month based upon what we described earlier as far as time frame astronomically, but maybe this is a different kind of month now. We, I mean, we really have no clue uh, what this really pertains to. No longer will there be anything accursed. You know, this Edenic curse is done, it's removed. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. It's just the fact that we are his bond servants. Yeah, as we, you know, we don't own ourselves. Uh, God made us and he saved us. We belong to him and we will serve him forever. He is God and we are not. Verse 4, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. That's the thing. We are owned by him. Uh, we're not our own. We publicly belong to him. Verse 5, and night will be no more, and they will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light. You know, in Genesis, God created light before he made the sun on day four. So this light, it's a supernatural light. It's from the creator himself. And they will reign forever and ever. Uh, how glorious it'll be, uh, we can't imagine what it'll be like. It's, it's a hope for us as Christians as um you know, spending eternity with the Lord. Uh, don't forget that you also have all this, the reinstatement of the Old Testament promises. Uh, you have a new heaven and new earth. You know, we saw in Isaiah 65. You have the new Garden of Eden, back in Genesis 2 and Ezekiel 47. The new Jerusalem. And again, there, there's several instances of this new Jerusalem. Is it the millennial Jerusalem? Is it the new heavens and new earth, new Jerusalem? Uh, you have to distinguish that. Uh, humanity rules as God's image. We see that reinstatement. As well. I know we think about popular speakers and writers, you know, your best life now. We know that's just not how it's supposed to be. It's, not, it's kind of a, um, a, a bad understanding. Um, you know, it's in the New Jer Jerusalem, the eternal state, that is going to be the best. Uh, what we have here on earth right now, our lives right now, it's nothing in comparison, even if you do have a great life now. So we close with this understanding of living. With all this, how then should we live? What does the scripture say? In Mark, it says, be on guard. Uh, we got to stay awake. We don't know when the master of the house will come. And so we need to stay awake. We need to be ready. Second Peter says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be? Um, we're waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. And you know, we're waiting for the new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. It says, therefore, since you're waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of the Lord as salvation. The Lord hasn't come because he still has grace. And when he comes, the grace will be put aside and judgment will occur. And so reach your neighbors, reach your family with the gospel. Second Timothy, I've fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to those who loved his appearing. You know, that day, we talked about that day. That's the last day, the last thousand years. And the beginning of the last thousand years is, you know, the day of the Lord, uh, the judgment on the earth. Uh, and then his reinstatement as king over the earth. And then finally in Titus 2, it said, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. 
training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is our blessed hope. So how should we live? Uh, you can find these resources on this website and any other kind of related documents that we will put together for you guys. Thank you guys so much for uh, going through the study. Again, it was just a short one. It's a very uh, quick overview. Uh, we, we didn't get to a lot of things, obviously, uh, with end time stuff. But just this was kind of a cursory overview of some of the key points that we've gone through in Adventure Club.